At this point in your organic chemistry education, you probably know and love the familiar SN2 reaction, the displacement of a leaving group or nucleophage by a nucleophile to generate a newly substituted product in which we have an R group, typically carbon, but not always, linked to the nucleophile, and X minus has departed with an additional pair of electrons. One nucleophile that we have not explored in these, this fairly simple SN2 context is an enolate, and one electrophile we haven't looked at yet is the alkyl halide or pseudohalide. When we combine a nucleophilic enolate with an electrophilic alkyl halide or pseudohalide, the potential is there for nucleophilic substitution by the enolate, which from the enolate's perspective amounts to an alkylation process, the installation of an alkyl group on the nucleophilic enolate. This seems very appealing because our nucleophile is carbon-based and the electrophile is carbon-based. So this is a strategy for the formation of carbon-carbon bonds. However, there are a few subtleties to consider here. Let's actually look at ester enolates first, because here the process is relatively more straightforward. In an ester enolate, we only have one alpha carbon. So I'm going to call the two R groups in the ester RO, the alkoxy group, and R prime for the alkyl group. And let's just say that we have an alpha carbon with two hydrogens on it. To alkylate an ester enolate once, all we need to do is use one equivalent of LDA. This generates the ester enolate intermediate. And here I've drawn it in its most important resonance form. Treatment of this intermediate with a primary or secondary alkyl halide or pseudohalide leads to alkylation. It's very important that the alkyl halide used be primary or secondary because, as we've actually seen before in Organic 1, the use of tertiary halides leads to elimination, not substitution. So provided we're dealing with a primary or secondary electrophile, displacement of X by the nucleophilic enolate then occurs, resulting in a substitution process. So the product here contains a new alkyl group. Here we're, we're calling it CH2. R double prime linked to the alpha carbon and ultimately what we've done is replaced H plus in the original ester with C plus in a way, right? This is from the enolate's perspective an electrophilic substitution, from the alkyl halide's perspective a nucleophilic substitution and it's referred to as alkylation because the electrophilic group that we installed in the enolate is an alkyl group. If we want to do this again, install a second alkyl group on an ester, all we have to do is hit with another equivalent of LDA. And then another round of alkyl halide, and it can even be different from the one we started with, to install a second alkyl group, alpha, to an ester. So ester enolates are pretty straightforward. And in fact, a similar strategy can be applied to ketone and aldehyde enolates, as long as we're cool with involving the kinetic enolate in the process. So I'm gonna go back to a ketone with two different alpha carbons. When we use LDA as the base to deprotonate, the kinetic or less substituted enolate forms preferentially. I'm going to show that by underlining LDA in red and highlighting the kinetically deprotonated, less substituted carbon in red on the ketone. If we then treat with an alkyl halide, let's just say it's primary and call it RCH2X, the result is alkylation at the less substituted carbon. And this works pretty well. You do sometimes run into issues with over-alkylation, since this proton can be further removed. However, as long as we only use one equivalent of LDA, form the enolate quantitatively before introducing the alkyl halide, generally we can get monoalkylation here pretty easily. The challenge comes in when we want to involve the thermodynamic enolate through the use of a weaker base, such as hydroxide or an alkoxide. So let's look at that same substrate the alpha methyl cyclopentanone. But now let's think about using a much weaker base, something like sodium hydroxide. And let's think about treating after treatment with sodium hydroxide with that same alkyl halide. There are a few problems here. Ideally, the product we would want out of this is one in which the more substituted carbon has been alkylated, something like this. But there are a few problems. One is that sodium hydroxide does not react completely with the starting carbonyl compounds. So reaction of hydroxide with the alkyl halide can be an issue, forming an alcohol through a simple substitution process. Another issue is that there are alpha hydrogens remaining in the product. And so if the product sees 
hydroxide base, it can be deprotonated and further alkylations can occur. These two issues generally add up to messy reaction conditions when we try to alkylate a thermodynamic enolate, an enolate generated just slightly under thermodynamic conditions. And we're going to see a much better way to form substituted ketones through enolate intermediates using a synthetic strategy a little bit later in this unit. So hold on. For the time being, just worry about alkylation of kinetically generated or less substituted enolates. We'll talk about how to generate these more substituted ketone products in a later video.